the now familiar. This year, 80 million passengers will fly from Heathrow and Gatwick. Their safety is in the hands of a handful of air traffic controllers. They're working at full stretch almost all day, almost every day. They cannot make mistakes. The implications of what could have happened if those aircraft had collided, obviously a huge loss of human life, and I would have been in court on a manslaughter charge. Tony Bridger worked at the West Drayton Air Traffic Control Center near Heathrow for 33 years. This winter, he's taken early retirement after making an error that could have killed more than 100 people. A Belgian Sabina aircraft with 120 passengers was flying east from Heathrow to Brussels. An executive jet was heading north towards Stansted. Planes often cross each other. They're kept at least a thousand feet apart in altitude. First, Tony told the private jet to descend. Let me tell you my mic. When ready, descend to flight level 130 to be leveled by Detling. Roger, descend to 130. Then the Sabina plane contacted him. London Control, this is Sabina 598 climbing to flight level 120. Uh, Roger, Sabina flight 598, climb to flight level 120. Roger, climb to flight level 120. Tony spoke to the Sabina plane again, telling it to climb, this time to a higher altitude. Climb to flight level 230. Inexplicably, he then forgot he had made this instruction. The Sabina plane kept climbing until it was at almost the same level as the private jet. Their paths crossed. When the aircraft became close together, the automatic warning system for air traffic controllers started. The two aircraft flashed on the screen. Victor Lima Mike, caution, a traffic dead ahead at uh, 400 feet below. Uh, can you see him? Yeah, we just crossed. It was about, it was very close. Uh, what is the altitude of that aircraft? Uh, Victor Lima Mike, do you wish to file an air miss? London Control, yes, we would like to file an air miss. It was really very, very close. What caused you to make that error? I don't know. Um, any job contains a risk of human error. We're all human, we all make mistakes. Air traffic control is one where we cannot afford to make mistakes, but people still will and still do. Tony Bridger was suspended immediately. An inquiry laid the blame firmly on his shoulders. After 50 hours of retraining, he returned to work. The last mid-air collision between passenger aircraft over Britain was 51 years ago. In the last 10 years, there has been only one death for every 10 million passengers carried by British Airlines. Yeah, I think so. He says he's going to continue as normal now. But some controllers at West Drayton say the system is being stretched to breaking point. They have not spoken out in public before because they fear punishment from managers. To conceal their identities, their words are spoken by an actor. I'm not saying flying's unsafe. It's less safe than it used to be. Managers are trying to force more and more aircraft through every day. The system's creaking at the seams. Sometimes we have so many aircraft coming through, we reach information overload. Many of us are concerned that it could be one of us that makes that fatal error one day. The latest statistics show cause for concern. Official papers called mandatory occurrence reports are filed when aircraft come closer than normally allowed. The number rose to 305 times last year, nearly one a day. Eight years ago, a disused brickworks near Southampton was chosen as the site for a new air traffic control centre to replace West Drayton. The building itself was completed in 1994. In theory, the powerful computers inside should help controllers to handle far more aircraft, far more safely, in increasingly crowded skies. This is the control room at Swanwick. 200 computer terminals with 2 million lines of software connected by 60 kilometers of cable. This room should have been the heart of Britain's air traffic control system for the last two years. It isn't. 
The chief executive, Bill Semple, now says that it will start work in winter 1999 or 2000. In fact, very few people we've spoken to here believe that will happen. There is now very strong speculation that Swanwick will not start work until 2001, 2002, or even 2003, by which time it would be seven years late. Swanwick is a very complex programme in which we are trying to bring on stream uh, the most sophisticated and the most advanced air traffic control system in the world. Uh, and it's taken us a bit longer than we had originally thought it would to do that. In the early days, we ran into some problems just because of the size of the system. They would say that it's, uh, it's potentially an excellent system, but then the, the public sector often does say that at this stage in a project. Uh, you know, that all the signs are that um, it could be a classic computer disaster. The software contained 15,000 errors. Sorting them out has left the computer contractor, Lockheed Martin, more than 100 million pounds over budget. The American company now concedes that the original opening date was over-optimistic and was never achievable. With the new center still years away, pressures on the old system are mounting rapidly. When a controller believes there are more aircraft than he can safely handle, he calls for help. There's usually chaos on the sector. You'll very often find spare controllers called in to listen in, to help the controllers who are actually operating. The whole atmosphere of the, of the sector is like a beehive going into rapid activity. The controller should file what's called an overload report. It surprises many controllers that the number of overload reports did not increase last year, despite a large rise in traffic. We are now getting evidence that a number of controllers are saying to us they filed reports which nothing's been done about and they haven't been registered or they've been dissuaded from, um, from filing such reports. We've been hearing this, uh, this rumour too and I have to say that I have been extremely concerned, as have been my senior managers, that this accusation should be around. As far as I'm concerned at the moment, there is simply no evidence uh, that it happens. Much depends on the controller's ability to take the strain. Younger controllers may choose to juggle more aircraft than others. If there's a buildup of traffic, you increase the speed of operation. You shift the traffic, and at the end of it, you come away thinking, that was busy, but it was good fun. You get a buzz from doing it. Technically, it may have been an overload, but you wouldn't think of it like that because you dealt with it comfortably. It's a macho thing. In 1996, there were 70 air misses between aircraft, a third more than in the previous year. National Air Traffic Services claim the rate of very serious incidents within that figure is actually going down. An internal memo indicates that National Air Traffic Services own managers believe there's a 75% risk their own deadline for opening Swanwick in 1999 or 2000 will not be met. One computer expert believes the entire Swanwick computer system could eventually be abandoned and the whole process started again. It's politically inexpedient to abandon the system at this stage. Too much is riding on its successful delivery. Unfortunately, that's a common problem with very large projects, is that you continue them knowing that perhaps at the end of the day you might have to abandon it, but for the time being you can't, politically speaking, uh, abandon the system. MPs on the Transport Subcommittee finished hearing evidence yesterday in their inquiry into National Air Traffic Services. Their report next month is expected to be strongly critical of the handling of the new computer system. It's part of the Civil Aviation Authority, so it promotes and regulates itself. It is both judge and jury on air safety. That is likely to change. MPs also want an independent financial and safety audit. Several controllers have suggested that the system is safe, but that it is less safe than in the past. I think I would perhaps quibble a little bit with that, but it's just about words. I would say the system is safe. The system is under greater demand than it has ever been in the past, and, and that demand will continue. Uh, and, and Swanwick will not make that demand go away. <laughs> it will give us more room, uh, but it will not make the demand go away. Uh, good evening, this is Goldcrest 509. Passengers will suffer longer delays this summer. 
Airlines believe 9% of flights will be held up for 15 minutes on average by air traffic controllers. Swanwick will not bring help for two years at the very least, and quite possibly a great deal longer. For passengers, that will mean years of growing frustration, disruption and delay. The alternative is further to reduce safety margins. And that's not an option anyone would choose. That report by Paul Clifton. In a moment, if we're not doomed already, we'll be hit by a giant comet in 30 years. First, a look at some of today's other stories. Imagine a giant asteroid a mile in diameter orbiting the Earth. It is out there. And according to scientists speaking today, it could have a very nasty landing on Earth in 30 years' time. Known as asteroid XF11, it is certain to pass close to the Earth, but there's only a one in a thousand chance it will hit us, releasing energy equal to thousands of atomic bombs. If you really want to be scared, you could book a seat to see the latest Hollywood blockbuster. In a moment, I'll be speaking to the director of Deep Impact, but first, the story. Comets are still headed for Earth. Steven Spielberg uncannily caught the public mood again. His next film, Deep Impact, made by the ER director Mimi Leder, tells of a world given notice of an impending bombardment by giant comets. It's being released just as scientists say a giant asteroid called XF-11 might hit us in 2028. At worst, scientists say it could kill a billion people and wipe out civilization. Watch very carefully. September, October, October the 28th, the two coalesce. And let's hope they miss each other. There's no doubt the Earth is in the danger zone, though the asteroid could just miss. But if you're alive in 2028, statisticians reckon you're more likely to be hit by the asteroid than killed in a car accident. The good news is it won't have as big an impact as the one we believe wiped out the dinosaurs. But for astronomers, it promises to be a big event in their million-year calendar. The United States and Russia have been building the largest spaceship ever constructed to stop the comets. In the film, scientists set out to block the asteroid. In real life, there are proposals from NASA and the USAF to try to deflect Earth-crossing asteroids with an explosion or a rocket blast. It is conceivable that uh, uh, science will be able to come up with uh, ways to deflect asteroids. But for many, that would just spoil the story. In the past, our demise was linked to earthly perils, plague and famine. Now we look to the skies for our nemesis. One cult, Heaven's Gate, believed the comet Hale-Bopp was deliverance, and dozens of their members committed suicide. Asteroid XF-11 is still a long way off, but it has the capacity to launch a thousand cults. Even here, in the middle of London, this magnificent Victorian church was built by a small sect which believed that Christ was about to return and that they and this edifice would be here to greet him when he appeared in the skies. And I have no doubt whatsoever that the appearance of this asteroid will be interpreted by prophets as a sign that God intends the end of the world to occur in the year 2028. But looking on the bright side, this asteroid may pass us by. By then, Hollywood will have moved on to the next big disaster movie. Well, I'm joined now from Hollywood by Mimi Ledo, who's just come from the cutting room where she's finishing off Deep Impact, and here in the studio by Jonathan Tate from Space Guard UK. And Mimi Ledo, were you aware when you were making this film just how prescient it was? No, I wasn't. I mean, I was very excited by, um, you know, the... I was fascinated and thrilled by the possibility of an extinction level event being real. But you never think it's real. You're just making a movie. <laughs> but in fact, you might be making something that perhaps is only 30 years away. Were, were people, were, I'm interested in where people who were involved in the making of the film, did it dawn on them that, that this was a distinct possibility? Very much. Our movie is very much based on facts. We had comet specialists, scientists, um, NASA people, um, and our film is very much based on fact. Um, uh, Jonathan Tate, NASA were making it clear today that they do not believe that this asteroid will hit the Earth. Um, why are you so sure we are in danger? Well, I'm not so sure we're in danger from this particular asteroid. 
Um, the joy of this is that we've seen this one. We know where it is. We know where it's going to be. It's the rest that we're worried about, the other 2,000 plus. But this is a particular this mile diameter, and yet there's perhaps a, what, a one in a thousand chance it's going to hit the Earth. One in a thousand is, is a pretty high stake when you're looking at 25 to 30 percent of the human population being killed. Mimileda, again, I mean, are you worried? I mean, now that you've heard what's been said today by scientists, are you actually concerned that when people come to see your film, there, there is an added impact that they actually know what's going on in the news? Well, Deep Impact addresses the, the, the situation that could happen. And it, um, Deep Impact hopefully will never happen, but you, what, only as a movie. Only as a movie, but, the, but in the film, if I'm not giving too much away, in the film, um, you actually, the, the Americans actually prepare a rocket to go up and try and intercept the asteroid. And the fact is the Americans and the Russians are preparing for such an eventuality and to see how they actually might respond to it. Is it in fact, yes, we do. And I think that, what is the question? I'm sorry. Well, I really say, that in fact, you are following fact in that sense. You say you've been speaking to NASA and so forth. But whereas some of Spielberg's other films were so much rooted, for example, you know, E.T. and so forth were so much rooted far in the future, this is the first time, in a sense, it's come so close to something that might happen. I mean, presumably that's great box yes, office it, it, for you. Yes, it could happen, and hopefully it never will happen in our lifetime. And what, it, what Deep Impact hopefully will do is make you look and reevaluate your life a little bit. But are we, are we do you think, Mimi Leder, do you think we are obsessed with doom? I think we are, and I think we should be obsessed with living our life to its fullest. Do you think? Uh, I think the more knowledge we have, the more control we will have. I'm sorry, over but this, our lives. I'm sorry, but this delay in the satellite, which uh, isn't helping a uh, flowing conversation. I know it's rough. <laughs> but, but Jonathan, again, I mean, spa you know, Space Guard UK calling your organisation something like that. I mean, it is all feeding into people's fantasies about the end of the world being nigh. What we're trying, the point we're trying to make, is that this is one major natural catastrophe that doesn't have to happen. This but is the one we can prevent. Oh, please. Are you, are you really saying that we can actually send, make sure that we hit this asteroid? Oh, this particular one, in 30 years' time, I have absolutely no doubt at all we can do something about it. So you think we're going to have the technology? We have the technology now. It's just not all in one place at one time. We've got to put it together. But the technology to do it is there now, yes. Thank you both very much indeed, Mimi Ledo, Jonathan Tate. Thank you very much. If there's one day when the attention switches from the Prime Minister to the Chancellor, it's Budget Day. And next Tuesday, Gordon Brown will be centre stage. But in order to make a big impact, he has to work some magic with a trick that will turn welfare into work. For that, he needs a spell whose ingredients include a way to make work pay for the thousands who are better off unemployed. Evan Davis has been casting an eye over the formula the Chancellor is likely to unveil in his budget next week. Alchemy was an early forerunner of chemistry, a respectable subject of study at the time, in which the nation's best brains engaged in a meticulous search for a magic way of transforming plain base metals into gold. It didn't work out, in fact, but it was certainly worth a try. And it's not so different to the budget process this year. The government's best brains are being employed in a meticulous search for the magic way of transforming our rusty old tax and benefit system into a shiny new one in particular one that encourages work. Now it's an ancient science, but success has so far proved elusive. The laws of nature just seem to make it impossible to manufacture pure gold out of a social security system. Here are some modern day social security alchemists at the Institute for Fiscal Studies in London. They use computer models to simulate the effects of tax and benefit changes. They've been doing it for years, but trying to balance the different needs of the system is irritatingly difficult. The more generous it is to us when we're unemployed, the less incentive we have to find a job. Somehow, therefore, the system has to be generous to us when we're in work as well. And that's where the fun starts. Well, you have to find the money from somewhere. So, you know, the Chancellor quite simply can't give money to everybody because somebody's got to be paying. Chancellor can't just produce money out of nowhere. 
So we, if he gives money to people on low incomes, at some point he's got to take that money away. And that's where our, your real problems come in, because while you're taking that money away, people have less incentive to work harder. If they earn another pound, the government takes a bit more of that pound away from them. So, in fact, it's not really a very easy problem to solve, sorting out, making work pay. It's a very difficult problem, one which, if there were an easy answer, I think we'd see the perfect system now. There's no magic formula to relate benefits and earnings. We can give cash to the low paid to ensure they're better off than they would be on the dole. Unfortunately, as the low paid earn more, you have to take that cash away. Faced with that loss, people on lowish incomes have little incentive to earn more or work more hours. You can take less cash away as they earn more, but that claws better off people into the benefit, and they'll now start facing disincentives to earn more too. Mr. Brown and his advisors can't abolish these problems, they can only reconfigure them. But they are keen to ensure working parents on lowish incomes get more. Their plan, a new generous credit to top up low wages, handed out through the pay packet, a working family tax credit. New? Uh, no. It last came up in the 1980s when Norman Fowler's review of Social Security suggested a similar credit called Family Credit. David Willits was then a Downing Street advisor. So I was sitting in the policy unit, a single male policy wonk. This idea looks very interesting. And I helped persuade Norman Fowler and Margaret Thatcher of the attractions of the idea. But in the event, Family Credit Mark I was dropped in favour of a Family Credit Mark II, which exists today. That's handed out to mothers at the post office rather than to fathers with their pay. It was the combination of the feminists who didn't like the fact that the money would go to the man in the pay packet and small businesses who were worried about the burdens of calculating the new, more complicated PAYE that led Margaret Thatcher and Norman Fowler in 1986 to change their minds. And that's how Family Credit was born. It ain't perfect, but family credit does appear to encourage work to some extent. I do feel better. I'm not that much better off in the pocket, but I do feel better. Kim Steadman works at the Pot of Gold Cafe in Cosham near Portsmouth. She's a lone parent on family credit. Gordon Brown hopes to uncover something near to gold in the social security system by reverting to a sort of family credit paid with wages and making it more generous. One of the things they might do in the budget is um, make family credit get paid into your pay slip here rather than collecting it at the post office. Would that suit you? That, I think that's a lot better, yeah. I would prefer it that way. Because you still feel that when you go in, it's the same sort of book as an income support book. You still feel that you're getting it from where you are, getting it from Social Security benefits. So you, you don't feel, I don't think you feel still a scrounger if you get it from the wage packet. You'd feel better about it. You'd feel it. a lot better, yeah. Changing the family credit formula, redesigning it, renaming it and paying it with wages, may have a psychological effect that modern researchers have yet to uncover. The budget may devise better forms of bronze while striving for gold. But we won't be able to completely avoid the fact that all social security systems are going to be impure. Evan Davis, tomorrow morning's front page of The Telegraph goes with freers over 150 freed paedophiles on figures from the Home Office. 150 will be in the community. And again, asteroid may spell doom for human civilization. The Independent, again, the sex offender story, it could be us. One in a thousand chance of an asteroid hitting Earth. And very finally, The Guardian has Mordecai Vanunu's come out of isolation after 12 years. That's all from Newsnight tonight. I'll be back with more tomorrow night. Until then, from all of us here, good night.